So for today's prophecy update, I want to talk about how fast everything is moving. Uh, I want to expound on this assertion that Trump's presidency is bringing the entire world to the boiling point. Last week we were talking about how that if you peel all the layers off of everything that is happening in the world today, particularly in the United States today, what you'll find at the core is the Christian and the Jew. That's what this is all about. When you take all of the politics out of it, you peel all the layers back from it, that's what you're going to find. This is a world that is increasingly hostile, as we were told it would be, to God's people, the Jewish people and the Christian. I think you would agree that since Trump has been in office, it seems that everything geopolitically and as such prophetically has been heating up very fast. And You'll forgive the cliche, but I personally believe that we ain't seen nothing yet. This may in fact be just the beginning. Doubtless you heard about the court's ruling in Washington State, my old stomping grounds, concerning a restraining order on Trump's temporary travel ban. It's not surprising, given that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that made this ruling is unquestionably the most liberal court in the United States of America. So much so that the Supreme Court of the United States has overturned approximately 90% of all the Ninth Circuit Court rulings. For those of you who are savvy concerning this, you're aware of some of the rulings coming out of this liberal court. If you can, I mean, that, that's even putting it kindly. Three judges basically made this decision. The fact of the matter is, the law is unambiguously clear in allowing the President of the United States to impose a temporary travel ban as Trump did. And oh, by the way, nobody seems to want to talk about how Reagan did it, Bush did it, Clinton did it, and Obama did it. But nobody wants to talk about that. I promise the Lord I wouldn't get angry today, so I'm not off to a good start. On Fox News, <laughs> Judge Napolitano, who is arguably one of the most brilliant legal minds today, stated, and I quote, this was precisely the wrong thing for the court to do. He explained that the Constitution assigns the decision-making for foreign policy exclusively to the President, with even Congress taking a supporting role. Napolitano went on to say, this is an intellectually dishonest piece of work that the Ninth Circuit has produced because it essentially consists of substituting the judgment of three judges for the President of the United States when the Constitution unambiguously gives this area of jurisdiction foreign policy exclusively to the president, that's why this is so profoundly wrong. Speaking of profoundly wrong, the fake news outlets, which are sadly fast becoming the new norm, flat out lied in their coverage of said travel ban. White House Policy Director Stephen Miller told Fox News's Sean Hannity that the media coverage of President Donald Trump's travel and immigration ban was frankly contemptible in the way that false statements have been made about the president's lawful 
necessary and fully constitutional action. We've seen example after example of individuals becoming radicalized and joining terrorist groups, Miller said. The reality is that it is a daily feature of life for law enforcement officials and federal investigators all across this country to be investigating and preventing terrorist attacks that are only being conceived of because we let these individuals into our country in the first place. Oh, come on, Pastor. We need to welcome them in. They're refugees. We need to welcome them in for safety. Hmm. Miller also slammed U.S. District Court Judge James Robart's decision last week to issue a temporary restraining order which halted the enforcement of Trump's executive order and he called it judicial activism. And oh by the way, they're pouring in now because of this. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Quoting Miller, an unelected un judge does not have the right to remake the immigration laws and policies for the entire United States of America. Let that sink in. This should be the most disturbing aspect of what we just witnessed in this country last week, that three judges can overturn a legal order from the United States of America's president, unilaterally, arbitrarily, liberally, and illegally, unjustly. That should give you pause. Think about that. Let that sink in. We didn't elect these three judges. Do you even know their names? They weren't on the ballot. Do you know who they are? No. Miller goes on to say, this was an issue put before 300 million American citizens and they voted to put in place new tough vetting measures so that we don't end up spending hundreds of billions of dollars long term dealing with the effects of an immigration system that is not properly controlled. And again, that's an understatement. I like how Trump tweeted, and by the way, you know why Trump tweets, right? He bypasses the fake news media. I, I actually started following Trump on Twitter. I, I just want you to know that there. I, I said it. <laughs> I don't have, I don't follow that many people on Twitter. I think I only have maybe 80, 90 people that I, that I follow. He's one of them. And uh, I, I did it because <laughs> I almost don't trust Fox News anymore. This last week, when, oh, it was actually two weeks ago, I'm sitting in my office and I got Fox News on. And it was Shepard Smith, which explains a lot who basically said that Trump had warned Israel to stop the settlements. And I thought, wait a minute, what? What? And as we talked about last week, I won't take the time this week, that was fake news. Completely spinned to say what the media wants it to say, and it's always anti-Trump and it's anti-Jew, and it's anti-Christian. So when this was breaking on Thursday, I go to Twitter, expecting to find the most vile, foul tweets concerning this immigration, this temporary immigration ban. And much to my surprise, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that there were numerous tweets that were actually supporting Trump. I had to go back and check to make sure I had the right hashtag because to make sure that I was 
looking at a feed of what was trending and I found tweets like this pictured here. I don't know if you can see it very well. It shows protesters in Europe with signs saying, Trump is right. And we will not stay silent as women are raped. Oh, did you hear about what's happening in Europe? Oh, oh, do, do you think that you'll forgive my cynicism? But do you actually think that the Muslim migration into Europe was to assimilate? Do you know that they've all but destroyed it? Do you want to see pictures of it? They're hard to look at. I mean the real pictures. Not the ones of the Europeans holding up signs saying, we welcome all refugees. They're not saying that anymore, by the way. Not in Europe, they're not. Not in France. Not in Germany. I read an article, didn't have time to vet it. Boy, I tell you, it's getting harder and harder to vet the authenticity of a lot of what I see in my newsfeed today. It was something about Angela Merkel offering to pay these Muslim migrants money to leave. The caption on this photo that I'm showing you read this way. As Middle Eastern migrants rape their way across Europe, thousands take to the streets in anti-Islam protests. Oh, we're not seeing that here, are we? How come you don't see this on I dare not say the, the, the acronym CNN. And in all fairness to CNN, I haven't seen this on Fox either. This is only on social media. I'm going to show you another picture you're probably not going to see on the news here in the U.S. Now, I know there are those who would say, come on, man, this is America. Oh, how many times did I hear somebody interviewed and they say, what Trump is doing is un-American. Oh, really? You look at this picture and what do you, what do you say? Oh, that, that's there. <laughs> that could never happen here in America. Do you think that? I would submit that if we here in America don't believe this can happen to America, then we've been deceived and have believed a lie from the father of lies, the devil himself. I think of what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica about God himself sending a powerful delusion, a strong delusion. It's very detailed, interestingly, because it's such a powerful delusion that they will, they will believe the lie. Not a lie, the lie. What's the lie? Well, certainly does seem that this could be part of the lie? The lie? Here's the truth. The Muslim migrants are pouring, and I mean pouring, into the United States for the sole purpose of domination vis-a-vis -vis Sharia law. Go to Dearborn, Michigan. No, don't. Don't. <laughs> and that's just one place. Oh, police officers? And we have amazing police officers here as a part of our, our church fellowship. They're my friends. 
<laughs> and uh, if you're a police officer in Dearborn, Michigan, you don't dare go into Dearborn, Michigan. You're out of your jurisdiction because they're not under the laws of the United States of America. It is lawless in that they are under Sharia law. And you don't think this can happen in America? Pastor, you're, you're fear-mongering. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You might accuse me of being paranoid, but this isn't paranoia, it's prudence. It's prudence, it's discernment. And it's actually, by the way, a healthy fear. We talked about this last week, and I think it would be appropriate to bring it up again this week. But have you ever asked yourself the question of why these Muslims don't go to neighboring, closer in proximity Muslim nations? Why do they want to come to America when they hate America, when they chant death to America. And oh, by the way, they chant death to America in America. You don't believe me? Well, you'll see. It's already happening. New York, not just Iran, they just had their celebration, I think, I forget what year anniversary, becoming the Islamic Republic of Iran, and the chance, death to America. America is the great Satan. <laughs> well then, why do you want to come here? I mean, honestly, tell me, if America is so bad, then why do you want to come to America? Oh, I know. I know why you want to come to America. Maybe we need to ask the question of, why don't you go to Saudi Arabia? I'm going to show you a picture of Saudi Arabia. Check this out. You know what this is? This is an area in Saudi Arabia that can comfortably house three million three million refugees in the facilities pictured here, complete with electricity, plumbing, and even air conditioning, which you need in the desert, by the way, anyway. And here's the thing. They sit empty all year, every year, except for Ramadan, which is only once a year. Why don't they go there? I'll tell you why they don't go there. They don't go to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is already Islamic. What are you saying? I'm saying that they want to come to America to make America Islamic. Did you know that? You know what the goal of Islam is? It's to have an Imam in a Christian church, teaching the Qur'an. Come on, Pastor, you need to get some more sleep. <laughs> I do, but <laughs> that's besides the point. Oh, and you might be surprised to know that they've actually been met with a measure of success in some churches today in the United States of America. Google Chrislam. What? Chrislam. C H R I S L A M. Chrislam. It's a hybrid of Christianity and Islam. Oh, we all worship the same God. Allah Akbar. Sorry about that. I. Uh, that was bad. That was bad. Did you know that 
a Jew cannot go to these countries? Talk about an immigration ban. And by the way, when I was in Egypt, this is back in the 90s, a long time ago now, um, with my wife, and we were staying with my aunt who lives in Giza, which is where the pyramids are, and I, I, I had, a, at the time, a pocket Bible in my hip pocket. Uh, really small print. I could never read that today, but uh, now it's the large print Bibles. But, and my aunt said, get, you better get that out of your pocket. You cannot have a Bible showing publicly like this. That was 1997. In Jordan, uh, my wife and I, well, my cousin uh, who was going to take us to Petra at the time, uh, was getting lunch. We were in Amman before the drive to Petra. And he goes into the store to get shawarma sandwiches. Oh my goodness. If you've never had a shawarma, you have not lived. <laughs> they are so delicious. So he's getting us sandwiches for lunch. And my wife and I are, you know, showing affection to each other. I'm hugging her and kissing her. And my cousin comes running out of the store. Yalla, yalla, basiyana, basiyana, yalla, yalla. I mean, what happened? Hey, the, the Arabs in the store, this, this is forbidden. It is forbidden. And they wanted to start a riot. I'm like, really? I, it was, I'm an Arab man and I have an American wife. This is forbidden. Well, here's, here's the list of nations. Let me just read it real, real quickly. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Syria, Algeria, Brunei, Kuwait, Lebanon, my birthplace, Oman, Pakistan, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and the United Arab Emirates. If you're a Jew, you cannot go there. And I would even suggest, if you're a Christian, I wouldn't recommend going there. I know that I can't go back to my birthplace in Lebanon. I cannot go. It is not safe for me. On Jan Markell's Understanding the Times radio broadcast, former Minnesota State Representative Michelle Bachman called this Muslim migration a planned invasion. And the purpose of this planned invasion is to destroy Western Christendom. Let me just read a little bit of what she had to say. We saw this mass migration, this people movement, which is a historic people movement of Muslims from Islamic nations tending to be the most radicalized nations, from those nations into nations that are known as Western Christendom. You don't see this mass migration into Russia, or into China, or into Indonesia, states Bachman. This is a planned invasion, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. I believe for the specific purpose of destroying Western Christendom, because that has been the strength of the world economically, but also the strength of the world in terms of leadership, the nations that are known as Western Christendom. Did you know that in the Quran, the Muslim is commanded to never take a Jew or a Christian as a friend? In fact, they are to behead the infidel, the people of the book. What book? This book the Jews and the Christians. This Muslim migration of refugees has been, is now, and I believe is likely to continue to be a Trojan horse in the sense that Islamic terrorists have concealed themselves within the wooden statue of the horse of refugees. And I found it rather interesting, you see it there on the screen, that Syria's president Bashar al-Assad would say as much. In an exclusive interview 
with Yahoo News just this last week at a presidential office in Damascus, Assad said President Trump's freeze on admitting refugees from his country, part of an executive order that has drawn widespread protests and is being challenged in federal court, is an American issue on which he would not take sides. But, asked if some of those who fled are, quote, aligned with terrorists, Assad quickly replied, definitely. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> Sleep well tonight. Assad went on, those terrorists in Syria holding the machine gun or killing people, they appear as peaceful refugees in Europe or in the West. Isn't that interesting? He said he couldn't estimate how many there might be, but he added, you don't need a significant number to commit atrocities. It's not about the number, and I thought this was really interesting, it's about the quality, it's about the intentions. The intentions. What are their intentions? What do they intend to do here in America? They intend to bring America under submission of Allah and His Prophet Muhammad. That is their intention. Here's where I'm going with this, and I'll try to calmly bring it in for a landing here. In Revelation 12, verse 12, we're told that the devil is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. That explains a lot, doesn't it? Does that explain why the heat is getting turned up? Does that explain why things are, quote, revving up? I use that word for a reason. Many of you know the reason. In Revelation chapter 20, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. And the word he uses for quickly is tacos in the Greek, where we get our English word for tachometer, a measurement of revolutions per minute, RPMs. In other words, the time is set, it's the revolutions that increase. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm going to come, behold, I'm going to come at a time when things are revving up. And Satan knows that things are, in fact, he's the one revving things up because he knows he doesn't have much time left. It's important to understand that the devil is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Satan does not know the end from the beginning. He is a created being. He is not the opposite of God, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Satan doesn't know when the rapture is. He doesn't know the day or the hour. But what he does know is just how close we really are. And he knows that he better get busy, and he is. And this is why he always has to be ready, because he doesn't know. All he knows is that his time is short. He doesn't have much time left. Sadly, this cannot be said of many in the church today. Would to God that the church and the Christian in the church in America today would know just how short the time really is. Would to God that we would wake up and realize that we are in the last hour of human history because we are. Oh, but pastor, they've been saying that for years. Every generation thought that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Well, that's what Peter talked about. And that's actually a fulfillment of prophecy in and of itself. Because Peter said that in the last days, that last hour of human history, there's going to be those who will mock you. 
They're going to say, where's this promise of His coming? Everything continues on as it has. And they're going to ridicule the Christians who are watching and waiting and longing for the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And you're going to be mocked for it. You're going to be excoriated for it. He's not coming back. Everybody thought he was coming back. And so the church just hits the snooze button on their spiritual clock and goes back to sleep. If you were to ask me what I thought the reason was, that would be my answer. The church today is spiritually asleep. And if you really think about it, when you're asleep physically, you're unaware of what's going on around you. Especially sound sleepers. And you know who you are. I'm not one of them. <laughs> A cockroach crawls across. I'm up and I can't go back to sleep, right? But you're unaware of what's going on around you when you're sleeping physically, and so too are you unaware of what's going on around you when you're sleeping spiritually. Why are Christians asleep? Because the church is asleep. If the Christian was in a church that wasn't asleep, that Christian wouldn't be asleep. Romans chapter 13 Verses 11 through 14, the Apostle Paul basically says this to the church in Rome. Wake up! Wake up! It's time to get up. The alarm is sounding. Don't go back to sleep. Our salvation draws nearer now than when we first believed. Put off the deeds of darkness. It's time to get serious. What are the deeds of darkness? Oh, <laughs> Behaving indecently, carousing, drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension, jealousy. Dissension, interesting. Instead, put on the armor of light. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how you can gratify the desires and the lusts of the flesh. You know when Paul says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, you know what he's saying? Stay busy in the Spirit. Stay awake in the Spirit. And if you're awake in the Spirit and busy in the Spirit, you won't have time for the flesh. You won't be interested in the flesh. When you're satiated and filled by the Holy Spirit, you won't have a hunger or a thirst for the things of this world. And that's the second problem. And the second reason. People are too caught up with the things of this world. Their roots are too deep in the things of this world. Let, let me ask you this question. We're almost done and I appreciate your patience, but I want you to think this through with me. Have you ever had a conversation with a fellow Christian? I mean, somebody that was a brother and sister in Christ and you're talking to them about the rapture and their whole countenance changes? <laughs> And upon further query, you find out that they're not really all that excited about the rapture. Now for me, that, that is a tough one. Because I, for the life of me, I cannot imagine why anybody would not be excited about the rapture. And I inquired of the Lord concerning this. Lord, what, what is going on here? I mean, you would think that every true Christian would be so excited about the rapture, that would be all they would want to talk about. You know, like me and uh, you too, some of you. But that's not the case. And the only thing that I can come up with is that their treasure has been laid up here on earth and not in heaven. Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure's in heaven, that's where your heart is. 
Paul, writing to Timothy, said, there's a crown waiting for those who long for the rapture. Did you know that? I can't wait to see what it's going to look like. I bet it's really cool. Now, some of you guys are going, come on, man, a crown, really? Listen, trust me, you're going to want this crown, okay? You're going to want this crown. But the problem is, is that Christians love the world and the things in the world, and it's what I call spiritual disability. They become spiritually disabled. What do you mean? Well, just as you can have a physical disability, so too can you have a spiritual disability. You're unable, spiritually disabled, if you prefer, when it comes to the things of God. This is what the Apostle John wrote in his first epistle, chapter 2. Verse 15, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And here's the thing. You ready for this? Wait for it. Here it comes. <laughs> The world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Maybe today you're here. And as a Christian, the Holy Spirit has been really convicting your heart concerning this. Maybe your fondness for your attachment to this world and the things of... It doesn't mean we don't have things in the world. Just don't let the world and the things of the world have you. What has your heart? It's not what's in your driveway. It's not what's in your bank account. It's what's in your heart. Where's your heart? Maybe today, the Lord would have you to afresh and anew commit to Him everything. Everything. Loosen that tight grip like this and hold on loosely. Hold on to it like this. And even now the Holy Spirit is filling in that blank, so to speak. What that is in your life that has supplanted that place in your life that should only belong to the Lord. For those who have never called upon the Lord, and the Lord sees your heart. I only see your outward appearance, and by the way, you all look marvelous. But the Lord sees your heart, and the Lord knows your heart. Just like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians said, the Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows I love, I love you. The Lord knows your heart today. And He sees your heart today. I pray that you'll open your heart today to Him. That you would call upon Him and be saved. If there's even a little bit of doubt, you need to settle that today before you leave and not put it off. I mean, if the question was asked of you, if you were to, and I, pastor, you're so morbid, whatever. If you were to die tonight, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven, that you would be in the presence of the Lord? I don't know. I, don't, I, I hope I would. No. John says you can know that you have eternal life. There should be no doubt. Like Paul who said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
There's that assurance of salvation, that blessed assurance, that blessed hope. And you can leave here today knowing without any doubt that you're saved on the authority of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It's the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's very simple. It's very childlike simple. This is known as the ABCs of salvation, which we've been talking about every week now. I love this. It is so simple. And it's something that you as a Christian can share with others too. It's not so, aren't you glad that salvation isn't complicated? Man, you can count me out. If, if, if salvation relied on physics and algebra, I'm doomed. <laughs> I'm doomed. It doesn't. It's very simple. Admit, A, admit, acknowledge, if you prefer, that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and missed the mark. It's an archery term. That bullseye of God's perfect standard of righteousness. We've all missed. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. And once we admit and acknowledge that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, then we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. That He was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead three days later. And that's the B. And the C is simply call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13 says, All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Pastor, you've been doing this every week. You're repeating yourself. I'm going to keep repeating myself. I'm going to, just like what the Paul, Apostle Paul said, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Because one day, it's going to be too late. And I won't be here. And you better not be here. <laughs> so all I can say is you better not be here when that trumpet sounds. And the dead in Christ rise first. And we who are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and be forever with the Lord. And oh, by the way, the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica, and I'm almost done. This will be my final closing. I just want you to know my final closing right here. The Apostle Paul to the Thessalonian church said, encourage one another with these words. I, I, I understand, I guess, in some way how some Christians um, can become upset, distressed, angry, depressed when they see what's going on in the world and they can become discouraged. I mean, I, I understand that it can be grievous, but how encouraging, how exciting, how exciting. We live in exciting times. Now, that may be, might be weird for some. You know, I mean, it's not that we say, hey, Islam has taken over in domination and Sharia law and beheading and praise the Lord. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I am saying is that Jesus said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, you'll believe. And when you begin to see these things be come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. I believe our redemption draws nigh. And if you don't know the Lord and you've never called upon the Lord, today needs to be the day of your salvation before it's too late. I hope you will. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. And I appreciate your patience, by the way. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for Bible prophecy. Thank you, Lord, that we can be encouraged as believers, knowing that everything you said would happen at the time of the end is beginning to happen, and even now coming to pass. And Lord, we do, by looking up 
loosen our grip on this world below in anticipation of our redemption drawing nigh. Lord, for anyone here in this church today or watching this online that has never called upon you, I pray that today they would open their hearts to you and call upon you to be saved with that assurance of salvation. Lord, thank you for the free gift of eternal life paid for in full on that cross. In Jesus' name, amen.